Hello and welcome back. This lecture will cover, uh, cover chapter four, navigating the business communication environment. And we have five learning objectives for this chapter. We'll be looking at the importance of ethics, corporate culture, interpersonal communication, time management skills. I think you really like that one. And what the trends in business communications are. So it's looking forward into the future maybe by the time you're ready for uh, your first major career step. Uh, some, some exciting and important information here, so let's get started. So what are the factors that play into a business environment? How is business communication different than, oh, say, academic communication or <laughs> just friend, friendly conversation at the, at the bar? Uh, well, you probably think, uh, first of all, about ethics. Right, that business environment, being a professional, uh, it's a certain type of behavior, isn't it? It's, it's certain values. It's things that uh, you would you could think about somebody uh, walking around an office and let's say they're cursing loudly. Uh, you might think, well, that's just not very professional. Uh, so it's, it's stuff like that all the way up to uh, uh, being a fraud and lying uh, about a safety uh, feature and getting people even killed. Uh, so this, this really covers a wide gamut, uh, but really what ethics are about is uh, good behavior, good values, what, what you might call a good moral compass. And it's not just about law and being, uh, doing a <laughs> conducting yourself in a legal fashion. Uh, it's really beyond that, and, and most companies, I think, would, would argue with this, that they're not just abiding by the uh, letter of the law because they don't want to get sued, uh, but they want to, but that they uh, want to promote uh, good ethics. They want uh, their reputation to be an example <laughs> to uh, other corporations. So it's very, very important. And we're going to be looking at lots of cases where, as a even an entry-level business communicator, you might find yourself in an ethical dilemma. Uh, of course, corporate uh, corporate culture uh, these vary uh, tremendously. If you go back, if you watch movies from the 40s and 50s, those old black and white movies, uh, you'll notice that most uh, people in that business environment are wearing suits and ties and hats, and they're, they're very formal. Uh, whereas nowadays, you might find a perfectly legitimate, respectable business, and everybody's just wearing shorts and sandals and t-shirts. Uh, so the point is not that there's just one corporate culture that everybody abides by, but that uh, every different corporation, uh, every business will have its own uh, culture. And uh, part of being a good communicator is being aware of that, learning about that culture, and really becoming part of it. Uh, interpersonal communication, uh, of course, this is one of those uh, uh, behaviors. You <laughs> uh, some people seem to have a lot of talent for it. Uh, some people, unfortunately, uh, come across as uh, being rude or... Uh, not friendly or uh, you know, the quiet type or whatever it is. Uh, really, what we want to work towards is being a good professional communicate, good professional communicators, which means that we'll have not only good oral and you know good speaking skills and good uh, uh, written skills. <laughs> what am I saying? Good speaking and writing skills, uh, but also nonverbal communication. We'll get into that. Even the way you sit in a chair. Uh, the way you walk, even uh, whether you're smiling or frowning, there's a lot of this nonverbal communication you may not be aware of, uh, but it could be communicating uh, things to your your audience, your coworkers, your boss, whoever. Uh, time management. This and this will tie back into the the ethics because uh, a lot of what employee employers complain about with their new uh, hires, especially college students, is that they're spending a lot of they're spending too much of their time looking at the web or on Facebook or a personal email or texting, uh, they're not really making good use of their time. Uh, and then, of course, the trends, you know, the all of the stuff, if you think about it, all of these other elements have changed over time. And we were talking about those old movies in the 50s and, and uh, how different things are nowadays. But, you know, project forward a little bit. You know, five, 10, 20, uh, 50 years, you know, however long you think you'll be in the uh, workforce, you're probably going to notice quite a few changes over time. Uh, so it's important to be aware of those and try to stay ahead of the game. All right, so here, let's get into the ethics. 
And of course, we're talking about more uh, than just corporate greed or these sort of big picture ideas, but you know, just day-to-day -day ethics. You know, you're at the workplace, you're sending emails, you're taking phone calls, uh, you're putting a PowerPoint to a presentation together. Uh, that's the kind of uh, ethics we're talking about here, those sorts of decisions, daily communications. And here's some questions to ask. Uh, one, am I including all the information that my audience needs? Uh, if you're a salesperson and you're communicating with uh, purchasers or potential purchasers, are you, are you really giving them uh, all the pros and the cons uh, of your product? Are you purposefully leaving out details uh, that would have an impact on their decision? Uh, and, or maybe something more serious, maybe you are not telling them about potential dangers uh, in a product, or you're not telling uh, your, work, your workforce that uh, some of this work might be dangerous, and, you, and here's what you <laughs> should avoid. Uh, so this is a very serious issue. Uh, so let's say you did, you said, well, I, I did put it in there. You know, it was part. I did mention it, but did you mention it in a way that the that audience will understand? Uh, I'm always concerned about installing a piece of software, and there's a screen that pops up, an end user licensing agreement, and it's a bunch of legal legalese is, is way over my head and there's just an option there to basically you could say i accept this or you can say no I, I don't accept it in which case it won't let you install the product uh, so yeah the the lawyers could say yeah we included all the information there uh, but i would argue that they didn't do it in a way that i would understand uh, they did it in a way that they knew i would just click on the okay and not, probably not even bother to uh, read it uh, so it's really not effective and you kind of wonder how ethical that is for them to be doing that you know maybe they've hidden something in that uh, agreement somewhere that if i knew what it was i would object to it and i wouldn't install that software uh, but the way they've gone about it i don't even notice it uh yeah which really this this ties into the next point is that are they putting it into a format uh, that helps them uh, grasp it quickly uh, so if it's something you, you could think about say uh, I always you like to use the example of uh, the airplanes and their safety pamphlets that they put in the seats. Uh, that's very colorful. It's very simple to follow. You can fold it out. It's, it's laminated. And it's basically using cartoons uh, with minimal text, and you could quickly you know, figure out what it is they're communicating there. Now, you could imagine an airline that wanted to uh, be unethical about that and, and sort of insinuate that there's no there's no dangers at all and the, there's no reason to be concerned about anything, uh, in which case they might uh, just have that information in a tiny little book you know, with nothing but text in it. And again, they could say, look, yeah, we, we put all the information in there. <laughs> you know, and if they had read it, they would have understood it. But you could say, yeah, but did you really go the, did you really put some thought into the format? Uh, did you make them basically want to look at it and want to read it? Am I taking information from sources accurately? This is, you probably think about journalism. You know, a lot of times a reporter or unethical editor, but more likely, uh, will take some quotations, but they'll, they'll only take part of the quotation. Well, they'll take it out of, completely out of context. And then they're, or they won't, uh, you know, <laughs> fact check, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, but they end up, uh, they can say, yeah, we used uh, sources, Okay, but again, they did it in an unethical way because they uh, presented it. it sometimes uh, make it sound, make it actually the opposite, you know, what the source might have actually been saying. So that that's another ethical concern. Yeah, even if you're playing clips, you know, re bits of a recording, as you see on the news all the time, if if you're only if you edit that carefully and just show a certain clip, uh, you can make it look like that source is saying something that they're not. Uh, by the way, this happens a lot with uh, scientific. Writing. If I'm putting together a movie about Bigfoot, let's say, and I have all these uh, experts on uh, to talk about Bigfoot, maybe one of them is saying that, you know, spends most of the interview talking about how this is a this is a myth and it's false. But maybe somewhere in in the midst of that, uh, he or she says something like, "Well, there was a time when I believe a Bigfoot might actually exist," and then I just take that little clip of Bigfoot might actually exist. And try to portray that as what the uh, expert was saying. Well, 
<laughs> you know, and you think I'm just making this up, and, and I am making that up, but it's, it's all too common. And it really shouldn't be that way. Uh, so anyway, let's see, where were we? The, the formatting, I would argue that we're talking there about graphics. Uh, but language, graphics, and document design uh, can all be ethical or manipulative. And, you know, this, that's the negative view. <laughs> of course, all of these things can be used uh, to make it more ethical. You know, if you have a, a tedious end-user license agreement uh, filled with legalese that nobody's going to want to look at, uh, that, that doesn't have to be that way, right? They, they could use clear language, uh, some, some graphics, maybe some cartoons there to kind of demonstrate what it is they're talking about, <laughs> uh, or just making the document design better. Uh, so instead of just having that one big page, just endless text uh, that nobody's going to look at, uh, maybe they put that, maybe they give you little, little blurbs of text at a time uh, so it doesn't overwhelm you and you actually can uh, grasp it more easily. Uh, so hopefully this is uh, coming together for you, uh, the ethics of just daily communications. We're talking here about corporate culture. And the main thing is, that, is to be cognizant of the fact that the, how, how much differences there are between organizations. And they make a point here, even, even within the same field. Uh, you might have a company like Microsoft, uh, which is a relatively formal, I guess you could say. It's probably not as formal as a place like IBM. <laughs> it's just guessing. Uh, but it, within that same uh, computing industry, you, you have a place like Google, uh, which from everything I hear about it suggests that it's, it's a lot more relaxed, a lot more of kind of a fun atmosphere of uh, people walking around in t-shirts and shorts, right, and, and sandals. Maybe, maybe they're even barefoot uh, versus the ones that or at Microsoft in the shirts and ties, or at IBM in a, in a suit. Uh, so this will vary. And of course, once we bring in the idea of international businesses, uh, you'll see even more variation. Uh, why is there variation? I mean, wouldn't it be more convenient if everybody just wore the, the same thing? Uh, well, the problem is that there's a lot of competition for the uh, top skilled workers, the really talented folks. Uh, they will, the companies will go the, you know, extra mile basically to try to recruit those folks and, and make them feel like they fit in. Uh, a lot of people just aren't, aren't comfortable in that super formal, uh, you know, suit, three-piece suit and all that, all that jazz. They, they want something a little more relaxed. Uh, so some of the companies will uh, cater to that. Uh, but of course, that has to be balanced with um, expectations of the, the customers, right? Uh, if you're trying to get people to buy your product or another company to invest in yours, uh, especially an international company, uh, they might look at that situation and feel like, well, th this is not a, why should I even take this company seriously, uh, right? They, they seem to be just goofing off all the time. Uh, so there's a good amount of balancing uh, that has to uh, take place here. I'll just mention a few of the things that the, the book talks about in terms of these uh, corporate cultures and how they're changing. Uh, one is the flexible work arrangements. So the idea of going to work from nine to five and, and coming home, doing that you know, five times a week, uh, that's actually starting to go away. And now we're seeing a lot more uh, latitude. Maybe you can do some of the work at home, uh, online. Uh, that, that's a big one. Uh, profit sharing, information sharing. Uh, it used to be that these companies kept everything tightly locked down in terms of information, but uh, now you're, you're seeing a little more co-op cooperation in some spots. Uh, health insurance and wellness, uh, all of these things are part of the modern business world. All right, let's get into the uh, interpersonal communication here. And this is just a fancy word basically for face-to-face -face conversations. And we'll be talking about communication between people, uh, the multiple skills that it involves, uh, listening, conversation style, uh, formal, informal. Uh, we'll be talking about nonverbal communication, always one of my favorites, uh, etiquette, uh, good manners basically, and networking. So we'll take these one at a time. All right, well, let's talk about listening. Uh, the first and foremost is it's crucial to building trust. And you can imagine being a, having a problem with a product, some kind of technical issue, and you, and you call up the tech support people and you're explaining 
uh, what's your problem? The problem is, and then they, they cut you off somewhere in mid-sentence and say, have you tried turning it back off and on again? And then you say, yeah, I actually mentioned that I did that. <laughs> it's the first thing I said. <laughs> you know, weren't, weren't you listening? You know, when that sort of thing happens, it really makes you question, like, can this person actually help me? Uh, does this person even really care? They didn't, they didn't even listen to what I was saying. Uh, so just from that example, and I'm sure you can think of something like that that's happened to you, uh, you realize how important that is. Uh, listening can be harder on the job than it is in class. So if, if you think it's hard to listen to a professor drone on and on, uh, you know, just wait for your, uh, when you have to practice listening on the job. Uh, first and foremost is the disorganization. Uh, so the professor, you know, when I put one of these uh, videos together, I have the, the very structured PowerPoint I can use uh, with all my points on there. I state the objectives up front so you know what, what's coming. And I guess you could go back and review it as much as you wanted to, but there's a lot of thought put into packaging this information. Whereas at a job, uh, maybe you just got sort of a, a colleague over there trying to show you how to use this new piece of software. Uh, he or she may not have sat down and thought about a you know step-by-step -step procedure. Uh, so you're just kind of getting little bits of information uh, here and there. Uh, plus, let's imagine too, we're on a factory floor. And there's lots of you know clanking machinery. Uh, who, who knows what all kinds of distractions going on around us. So uh, it can be very easy to get distracted, not really uh, pay attention to what somebody's trying to show us. Uh, so it definitely becomes more difficult. Uh, they, they're talking here about listening to feelings as well as information. Uh, so again, one of the, uh, you know, I kind of want to jump ahead into the nonverbal communications uh, thinking about this too, but uh, when you can listen to somebody, if somebody comes to you and says, uh, look, I'm having a problem, I'm having a problem with, uh, I can't figure out how to, how to copy and paste <laughs> you know, in this uh, new version of Word, let's say. And let's just say that uh, one caller says, hey, hi, could you help me? I'm having some problems copying and pasting. You know, if you're listening to that, it doesn't sound like the person's upset. It just sounds like they're kind of uh, just seeking information, right? Uh, well, let's compare that to somebody that says, oh, my God, you know, I'm just so frustrated here. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> I can't copy and paste. Uh, well, that's kind of an extreme example there, obviously. Uh, but you get the idea I'm trying to make, right? Uh, that one person's very upset, and we need to be aware of that uh, before we start preparing our response is going to be different uh, than the person that's very calm and collected. And again, that's an extreme example, but you'll notice if you get good at this, uh, even sometimes uh, somebody might be really annoyed, but they're not really making it obvious, but a really good listener can still pick up on it. And then as you're listening, you want the person to know it. You don't want them to think you just drifted off or you're daydreaming. Uh, so some simple strategies, just nodding, and, you know, the point is not to nod up and down like some kind of, a, <laughs> you know, robot or something. Uh, just when it's appropriate, nod. Uh, it's smiling again. Uh, smile or frown. Obviously, you want to be doing these at appropriate moments, uh, not sh suggesting that you, uh, you know, not smiling when they're giving you, uh, telling you <laughs> that they're having pain. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, but these... Uh, Simple facial gestures can go a long ways towards listening. So even as you're listening, it's not as though you're not communicating. You know, you're know, by you're listening, yes, but on the other hand, you're nodding, smiling, frowning, whatever, uh, different ways to, to move about. And it, it's sort of communicating back at them. So even though you're not talking, you're still communicating back. Uh, you're showing them basically, yes, yes, I got that, listening. Uh, which brings us to the point of, Active listening. Uh, receivers demonstrate they've heard, understood a speaker by feedback. So feeding back the literal, the literal meaning, emotional content, or both. Uh, so this one is, again, another, you see a lot of this in customer service, in tech support. Uh, somebody will tell you about their problems, and you, you say, well, okay, let me get this, uh, let me just uh, put it in my own words here. Uh, so it sounds like what you're saying is, you know, X, Y, and Z. It sounds like what you're saying is you're having trouble uh, copying and pasting, you know, it wouldn't be much point in repeating that, but at least it would show that, yeah, I get it. 
Uh, I get the problem that you're having. Shows shows you understand. And then the person could say, no, that's not what I'm saying. Or they might say, yeah, that's that's so just kind of a way to confirm. Let me just you know run this by you. Is this what is this what you're saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying. So you kind of double check yourself. Uh, emotional content might be sort of something saying something like, well, I, you know, I'm sorry about this. I can tell you're uh, really upset about this. And just kind of acknowledging that so they don't feel like they have to keep, maybe even on a subconscious level, it's like, well, okay, I've communicated. I know I've uh, communicated that I'm upset. Uh, maybe I don't need to keep communicating that. Uh, maybe you can sort of start diffusing that situation a little bit just by acknowledging that. Uh, to, in creating active responses, because I think I kind of jumped the gun a little bit on this one, but uh, paraphrasing content. Again, so somebody comes to you with a problem, they explain the problem, and you just say, uh, you just state it back to them. Not, not in the same exact words. Paraphrasing just means you kind of put it into your, your own words. Uh, but you, you say it a slightly different way uh, so that that gives them a chance to say, yes, well, that's what I meant. Uh, or, no, that's not quite what I meant. Uh, mirrors uh, the speaker's feelings. Uh, so if somebody comes to you with bad news, you know, if, if they're talking about how they lost some money or they kind of lost their job or, or they're, they're dissatisfied uh, at their job and they, they really seem sad about it, uh, you don't want to be sitting there with this big smile on your face <laughs> looking like you're so happy. <laughs> that just doesn't really work very well. Uh, when somebody's communicating sad information, they expect you to look like you're sad too, uh, that you uh, empathize with them. And I think for most of us, that just comes naturally. Right? But uh, you know, some people just don't have a lot of facial expression. Some people just don't really have big, you know, facial expressions. Uh, that that's fine. They can actually learn uh, to, I guess, sort of fake it a little bit, or at least kind of exaggerate it, try to bring it out a little bit more, uh, so that people can uh, feel like you're actively listening. Uh, asking for information clarification, uh, another good strategy. Uh, if you show that you're curious, if you're asking for information, it's basically saying that uh, you're either curious to know more, uh, you want to know more, you're, you're trying to help, uh, you're trying to uh, help them tell their story, basically, to clarify up, uh, clarify some points, uh, figure out maybe there's something that they're not, they don't think is important for you to know, but it, actually it is, <laughs> so you're asking about it. Now, all of these things can go a long ways towards uh, basically showing them, yes, you're actively listening, you're really trying to help them. Uh, so think about those these three things in particular. Uh, and then uh, lastly, offering uh, to help. Now, this, is, this is another one, I guess, that varies tremendously depending on uh, the situation at hand. Uh, but... Uh, I'm trying to think of a, a situation like this. So let's just say the stu uh, I had a student that was uh, telling me about um, a problem they were having with, uh, let's say, this Connect software. And uh, they're, they're telling me that they can't upload their file, let's say. So when the uh, first thing I might say is, well, it sounds like what you're saying is that you're having a, you can't upload, you can't attach the file uh, to the Dropbox, let's say. They say, yes, that's that's what I'm saying. Uh, the mirror of the speaker's feelings might say be something like, well, that, that I might say something like that. That is frustrating. I know that's frustrating. Man, you know, I've been there before. Uh, let's see what we can do about it, right? Uh, asking for information. So I might say, well, are you using Safari? Are you on Firefox? Are you using uh, Internet Explorer? You know, I might ask for something like that. And then, of course, I would offer to help. I mean, that would be the whole point of this, but... Uh, might, I might even say something like, you know, it sounds like uh, this is a problem that we might, I might, it might be even more helpful for you just to come into the office, bring your laptop, uh, I can take a look at it, uh, you know, just look at, I can just <laughs> see it on your laptop, uh, might be easier than trying to talk about this on the phone, let's say. Uh, so anyway, all of those responses would go a long ways towards showing, yes, I understand the problem, I'm trying to help, I'm, you know, I sympathize uh, <laughs> with the feelings. And it's probably going to be successful, you know, even if I'm not able to solve the problem, you know, at least they know I'm taking them, them seriously, I'm showing respect, and I'm trying. All right, let's look here at some listening errors. Uh, inattention, uh, cause of listening error, obviously. 
Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've uh, had students complain, well, you didn't tell us to do this, or you didn't mention that we needed to do this on our assignment. Really, I did mention it, just they weren't listening. Uh, so how can you prevent that? And again, uh, paraphrasing what the speaker has said, uh, this is very useful. Uh, when you're confused about something, uh, or one of the ways to make sure that you do understand what somebody is saying is, again, to try to put it in your own words, right? So if I said, you know, let's just say I gave, said that I want you to do this, uh, I want you to write a memo, and the memo needs to be at least one page. And this you might say, so, so are you saying that it used to be somewhere between 300 and uh, 500 words? <laughs> which is about a page, right, double-spaced, I uh, might say, yeah. Or I might say, no, that's, you know, I actually needed to be longer than that or whatever it is. Uh, so that's, you know, you're putting it back. You're not really 100% sure that you got it, so you just put it in slightly different words, and uh, you either get a yes or a no. If you get the yes, that's good, you know, move on. <laughs> if, you, if you get the no, then maybe the uh, you can kind of get that clarification that you need. Uh, check your understanding with the speaker. And a good speaker will be mindful of this too, right? They'll ask you, do you feel like you got a pretty good handle on this? Or does anybody have any questions? Uh, anything like that. And if they're showing you, you know, you might be in a situation where they're sort of showing you step-by-step -step, hands-on, you know, how to use a machine or how to use the software. Uh, so it's always nice uh, to say, uh, you know, could you just let me do this myself one time while you're watching and make sure I'm doing it right? You know, this is great. Uh, writing down the key points. <laughs> yeah, obviously, uh, deadlines, uh, related information. A lot of people don't even, you know, ask about this, and it's, it's always good, especially at a workforce. If, the, if your manager comes in and says, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, uh, your first question should be, well, when, when does this need to get done? Is this... You know, as soon as possible. You know, is this high priority stuff? Is it uh, is it okay to you know, just do a lot of planning because we have more time? Basically, are you going to need to do some research? You know, all that stuff is good to know. Uh, how work uh, will be evaluated. Uh, this one is really crucial for uh, things like grants. Uh, so a lot of I think I mentioned this before, but a lot of businesses operate now. Uh, based on government grants. Uh, so they'll prepare these documents and they'll submit them and then the uh, grant, who's, who's ever the government agency or whatever that's uh, giving the um, awards for these grants will have certain ways to evaluate them, certain things they're looking for. Uh, basically, they, they won't just pick the one they like the best. <laughs> uh, they've got these criteria they follow. And, and knowing that, in advance will be tremendously powerful. It'll give you a big advantage. And here's a couple other tips for avoiding listening errors. Uh, don't ignore instructions that seem unnecessary. Man alive. <laughs> oh, this one. Uh, uh, classic case of this. I, I, a lot of time, one of my sort of things is I really like to see um, prop, I like to see a nice, neat, neatly formatted document. Now, not so much in this class. It's, it's this is a business writing class. Uh, but if I'm teaching English 191, uh, I'll, then I'll say I want, you know, the proper MLA heading on that paper. And all you have, you know, I got a video that shows them how to, to how to do it. Uh, I can I tell them uh, go, you can go to the right place and get a handout uh, that shows you how to do it. Uh, you can. Uh, you know, just go to Google and type in MLA heading. <laughs> it's just a little thing, and it's, it's just kind of important to me. It shows me, when I see that heading just right, you know, with the, my name, the, the date, the course uh, on it, it shows me that uh, this student cares enough. They, they, put some, they put some effort into the format. Uh, they, they respect the assignment. They're trying, right? They're, they're putting in effort, and I, I like to see that. It's just one of the main things a teacher looks for is, you know, are you applying yourself? Are you, do you even want to succeed, basically? <laughs> and that's just kind of a minor point. Uh, and it might, but, but really my point is this, a lot of students would say, well, he's not going to care about that. Uh, who cares about the formatting? You know, I got good content or, you know, I got the right number of words. Uh, that MLA stuff's not important. 
I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, but really, that turns out to be a big thing because I've sometimes been known to dock, you know, students a whole uh, point for that, a whole, you know, half a letter grade, basically, uh, just for not getting that right. And something like double space, uh, another thing. Uh, so if I have all those instructions, uh, double space your paper, and that just gets ignored, uh, that just seems like, you know, uh, they didn't care. And again, they probably do care, and that they're just, it's just a, a listening error. They didn't, uh, uh, they weren't listening hard enough or uh, reading between the lines, I guess, to see that actually is important because, you know what, he, he probably wouldn't have put it in the instructions <laughs> if it was unnecessary. Uh, so anyway, that, I hope I didn't go on for too long with that point, but, but it is important. And even more so, man, again, you know, you get to this, this corporate world and you've got these uh, style sheets you need to follow or they, uh, I remember one example was, uh, I worked at a law office one time, and they, it was a temp, temp worker, temporary guy, and they had me on the phone, and I was picking up the phone, and I had to, every time somebody called, I had to rattle off this, this name of the law office, and there's like seven different lawyers there. It's like, hello, welcome to Smith, Jones, Edwards, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it just seemed like it was uh, unnecessary. Like, why do I have to say that every time? That's so, so lengthy. Uh, so I decided it would. I'd just shorten it and just say, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you reached the law office, and I didn't rattle off all the names, and you know somebody overheard that and ran over there and basically, uh, you know, told me I can't do that. <laughs> you had to read the whole thing, uh, but it just it made me look like I was already trying to, uh, you know, be lazy and, and I wasn't good at following instructions and. You know, I was just basically a kid, you know, so <laughs> I'll forgive myself. I'm just telling you that story uh, so that you don't make the same mistake. So when, when somebody's there, and if you're really listening, and they're telling you uh, how to do something, then just do it the way they tell you to do it, uh, because even if it seems unnecessary to you, uh, it might really turn out to be something that can get you fired even. So, again, I didn't get fired, but <laughs> I didn't like getting in trouble either. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, consider the other person's background. Uh, this, you know, that's, that's kind of a general point there, but uh, I guess what they're getting at there is uh, how much expertise the person has, how long they've been there. Uh, maybe they're not, uh, maybe there's a language barrier. Uh, who, who knows? Uh, but this could be a factor in, you know, if somebody's, uh, maybe if English isn't their first language, that just means you really need to listen even more. All right, so you, you really want to be careful and think uh, this is when you really, you'd really want to do that paraphrasing and the rewording because uh, maybe they're uh, struggling to get the, the point across in language that you can understand. It's very helpful to them. Say, well, you know, here's what, I, you know, here's what I'm hearing, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you might have to do that two or three times, right? Or use, uh, it doesn't hurt sometimes, just bring, you know, take out a piece of paper, start sketching stuff out. You know, start making diagrams, drawings, whatever, uh, whatever it takes until you get to that point where you feel like, yes, we <laughs> we understand each other. All right, so now we're getting into uh, dealing with problems. Uh, so we, we all have to deal with problems. Uh, <laughs> sooner or later, you're, you're going to have a problem, and you're going to have to find a way to respond to it. And uh, what you're trying to basically do is not create a bigger problem. So you may not be able to solve the problem, but at least you can avoid making it worse. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the goal. So here's some things that would just make it worse, right? So ordering or threatening the person. You know, imagine you, you've got some problems with, uh, you're having some problems with Connect, D2L, whatever, and you, and you come to me and you're saying, look, I've got, here's the problem, and then I say, well, <laughs> you better figure it out because <laughs> that assignment's through tomorrow and, you know, you're going to, make an F if you don't turn it in on time. Uh, that's not helping you, right? You know that. That's just make, It's just making the situation worse. Uh, preaching, uh, same sort of thing, right? Holier than thou mentality. Just, just just criticizing someone. This is really horrible. I mean, if somebody, if it's, you know, I would never do this, you know, but if I, I, <laughs> I have a hard time even imagining it, but, you know, again, well, well, that just, you know, if you weren't such an idiot, you could figure out how to submit that assignment. Uh, again, this, God, totally unhelpful. This is just the exact opposite 
of good business communication, right? And unfortunately, there's still people out there that, that do this stuff, and they, uh, I guess they think it's fine. They're uh, in a position where they can get away with it, but I really, it's just, they really should be uh, taken out of those uh, positions, in my opinion, because they're just doing a lot more harm than good with this stuff. Uh, minimizing the problem, uh, again, if you're paying attention to their emotions, if they're really upset about something, and I'm just acting like, oh, well, you know, big deal. <laughs> or, you know, I've, I've been through the same thing and, uh, you know, I got over it. <laughs> you know, any of those kinds of responses are, again, not helpful. Uh, you, mean, again, you don't want to do the opposite and exaggerate it either, but uh, you just kind of have to be savvy enough, I suppose, uh, uh, not to, again, make the problem worse. Uh, by making it sound like you don't care or that what they're going through is nothing. You know, you hear this all the time, uh, especially with, oh, some, let's say, prof I, I, keep, yeah, I don't want to keep using professors and students over and over again, but, you know, imagine, uh, let's just say you're the new person at the job uh, and some of the people that have been there forever, uh, you know, you come to them with a problem and you're complaining about something and they might just say, well, that, that that's, you know, trust me, trust me, Junior. You know, once you've been here for as long as I have, you realize that's uh, that problem is nothing. Yeah, you know, it's again not really helpful. Uh, advising. Uh, this is kind of a tricky one. Uh, we'll get into some of the some of Deborah Tannen stuff here in a minute. But uh, sometimes when somebody is communicating a problem to you, they they don't really want you to try to solve the problem. Uh, they just want you to sympathize with them, right, or, or or understand, you know, where they're coming from or how something's affecting them. Uh, so the point is not for you to turn around and say, okay, well, I've got an easy fix for that. <laughs> you know, you might, uh, that might actually do, again, make the problem worse. And I say this one's the trickiest one because, at least for me, this is always my impulse. Somebody comes to me with a problem and I'm always thinking, well, what, what, what can I do to help you solve the problem? Uh, but sometimes this is not uh, what's they're there for, right? They just want me to be aware of it. Uh, so I'm not sure what, if there's a magical solution to this one. It's just a matter of really actively listening. Uh, so here's some stuff about conversation style from uh, Deborah Tannen. And she's done a lot of work looking at how uh, men and women communicate and the, the differences between uh, basically the way they, they talk uh, to each other and you know, between men and women, and, <laughs> you know, the whole gamut. And really, these are just some things to consider about conversations. Now, one is the, the rate of speech. You know, sometimes uh, people get nervous. They start talking really, really quickly. You can barely follow what they're saying. They're talking so fast. <laughs> so that's something to be mindful of. Uh, the rate of turn-taking. Uh, so this, this is a lot of people just you know, especially if you're in a group situation where you, maybe everybody's sitting around a table and you're trying to have this uh, business meeting, uh, you got one person that just talks forever and just hardly ever leaves a little gap in there for somebody else to get a word in. Uh, then that's a problem, right? You want to say, say a piece, let somebody else uh, say what they need to say, let somebody else come in. Uh, it's okay if there's uh, some silence, you know, as somebody con contemplates what it is they want to say. Uh, ideally, you want to try to make these, uh, you know, people equal, equally, uh, equal participation, right? So if I'm talking to you, uh, you do about half the talking and I do about half the talking. Uh, that feels good to me. Uh, the persistence, if the turn not acknowledged. Uh, so kind of relating to that one, um, you know, somebody is just sitting there and they've, they've got a point they need to make or, or want to interject and they can't seem to get <laughs> this person to stop taking their turn, let them take their turn. Uh, that can be a problem. Some people will just say, hey, you know what, I'll just forget it. And you feel kind of bad uh, when you're not able to say what it is you, you wanted to say in that meeting. Uh, so, a preference for personal stories. Uh, so, some people will um, like talking about uh, themselves, I suppose, or I know I, I do this a lot uh, when I'm advising students. I'll tell them about my own uh, experiences uh, when I was in school and so on and so forth. But other people don't like this at all. You know, they'll, they'll never talk about anything personal. And so that's something to be aware of. 
the tolerance of simultaneous uh, speech. Uh, so I think what De uh, Tannen's point was, Deborah Tannen's, is that some people are kind of comfortable with interrupting each other, talking over each other. Uh, whereas for some people, this is a real insult. Uh, abrupt, uh, abrupt topic shifting. Uh, so I, this is uh, another one that you might not be aware that you do this, but sometimes I've talked to people and, you know, one minute you're talking about a, a project and then suddenly somehow we've shifted over and they're talking about uh, something that happened at their job that doesn't seem to have anything to, to do with the former topic. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, say this. So Tana's point here with these uh, features is that any one of these can cause conflicts. So if you are a person that is very tolerant of simultaneous speech, uh, but you're talking to somebody else who's who hates this, uh, then you might be uh, entering and you might be actually making them angry or upset and not even know it. Uh, so again, being aware of these things, if somebody likes to talk, if somebody's fine with the sh uh, topic shifting, now I got plenty of colleagues here that they're really comfortable with this and they can do it all the time. But if I'm talking, sometimes I'm talking to somebody else and I'll shift the topic and they'll just look at me like, <laughs> you know, like I'm crazy or that I'm uh, sort of absent-minded or, or chaotic or something. They wanted to keep talking about that uh, same topic some more. Uh, so really the point here is not that there's, you know, one size fits all strategy for these features. It's more about being aware that people differ uh, in each one of these. And if you can, if you can be, if you can have that kind of awareness, you can be more effectively uh, communicating with them. All right, here's one of my favorites. I, I love this topic of nonverbal communication because it's just something that most people don't ever think about at all. And you think, well, all, all that matters is what I say. Uh, but they're not, they're not even realizing how much they're communicating without words. Uh, even their posture, the way, the way they're sitting, are they rolling their eyes? Do they have a big frown on their face? Are they, are they, is their forehead, you know, kind of uh, furrowed, uh, like they're confused? And uh, all of this stuff is uh, communication without words. Uh, so they talk to you about, you know, smiles and gestures. <laughs> Can be misinterpreted as easily as words. You know, how true is that? I've, I've met some people who... Uh, when they get nervous, they start to giggle, or they they start to grin, and it looks like a like a smile. Uh, so in that one is uh, maybe they can't even control this, right? So they uh, maybe they've they've done something wrong and they're getting into trouble, uh, but they've got this grin on their face or they're giggling, and then that that comes across as uh, well. This person just thinks it's a joke. Uh, this person doesn't even care that they've they've uh, crossed they've broken some rules right and so that's just a complete misinterpretation really it's just a nervous reaction uh it really should be interpreted basically as looking uh, scared or, or fearful uh but they're maybe they're not aware they're doing it or maybe they they can't control it so let's see be aware of uh, spatial cues and body language uh, so the spatial cues uh, this this has to do with, uh, well, I think one of the examples I, I thought was helpful in the book was the, the size of somebody's office. You know, so if somebody, if you got seven employees and one of the employees has this big corner office that's twice the size of the other offices, uh, that probably means that person is higher up on the org chart, right? Well, where do people sit around a table uh, is another one. Uh, I use the if you watched uh, the State of the U State of the Union address, uh, you'll notice that some people are up front, kind of in positions of importance, and then you got all the way back. And by <laughs> the time you get to those back rows, you're probably dealing with uh, very minor officials. Uh, so the point there is, you know, if you were one of those minor officials and you tried to sit at the, sit on the front row, uh, you'd probably be told that you know to back <laughs> go back to the back, and you'd be embarrassed by that. So just being aware of those uh, spatial cues. Uh, body language is one that uh, I think more about. Uh, I I don't think it would. I think it's a good idea if you're prepping for a job interview. In addition to the resume and all the usual stuff, just just to practice even walking around. Uh, so practice walking in. You, know, you could pretend like your dorm room or your apartment is the the job interview office and get a friend there to to play the role of the uh, 
interviewer and just practice you know walking into that room uh, work on your uh, your stride you know work, walk confidently uh, shake hands if, if you want to do that and work on that uh, work on uh, sitting down and work on uh, the way that you're sitting in that chair right are you slumped over <laughs> are you too lean back <laughs> are you leaning forward too much and get your friend there to say to just give you some tips and uh, that, that'll help a lot because uh, usually with body language the problem is you're not aware of, of what you're doing uh, and you're not aware of what it what it looks like uh, to the audience so again doesn't need to be <laughs> you not to be an expert uh, to figure this stuff out uh, any good friend or your parent or family member whatever uh, if you just get them to uh, to watch you practice a few times and and say you know point out if i'm doing something weird with my face or if i'm got this weird eyebrow thing going or w whatever it is just 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 don't i'll not be don't you won't embarrass me uh, just tell me what it is so then i can work on it okay now we're getting into etiquette or basically good manners uh, treating people with respect is uh, really what this is is all about and so much <sighs> You know, so much miscommunication uh, really comes down to this. Because if, if your audience doesn't, remember we talked about goodwill, right? And so it doesn't really matter what kind of information I'm trying to give you. If, if, I, if I've disrespected you and you feel like I have no respect for you and you, you basically don't like me if you think I'm a jerk, uh, you're not going to really uh, listen to what I have to say. So even if it's important information, you're already, you're already tuned out and basically it's going to be a failed communication so again so important uh, to treat I need to treat you with the respect of course you know it's also a two-way two-way street uh, so let's look at some of the simple things you can do please thank you <laughs> you're welcome uh, so I remember when I was uh, first starting out as teaching I thought well I shouldn't have to say please you know, to a student like if I said please make your you know please turn in your assignment on the you know two o'clock thursday whatever uh, i would say i don't really need to say please right because it's just something they, they should do you know they, they should do that because i told them to <laughs> and thank you i shouldn't have to thank them for turning in their work so that's just a really stupid attitude it's kind of the attitude of somebody who's really insecure uh, somebody who's not not a good communicator and you know and as i learn more about business communication uh, i learned it's, it's really not uh, these are never bad things you know it doesn't matter if you're the the president uh, although you know you could be the CEO the, the you know the biggest of the the biggest boss there is and you'll still hear he'll hear these people saying please and thank you and, and you're welcome and uh, being very polite uh, and I would say that's probably why they one of the reasons that they got to those positions is that they did treat at least they treated the right people uh, let's put it that way <laughs> so they treated the right people with respect and uh, they continued to do so and uh, when people see that and they they feel like you respect them they'll, they'll be a lot happier to you know, put in that word good word for you to, rec to recommend you uh, for that raise and, and all this stuff so I'll just get into the habit it usually what I do when I email a student I'll just write out you know the assignments are due tomorrow at two o'clock and then I'll go back in and put see well let's see i put the please there uh put the thank you there if they're if they submitted something and they're if they're thanking me you know of course uh, you're welcome is the appropriate response uh so these are all great and I, I, i'm just going to say briefly something about this last one you're you're welcome uh, so there's a habit nowadays um uh, when somebody says look you know i really appreciate uh what you've done here you know <laughs> i just i can't thank you enough uh, really the appropriate response to that is just to say you're welcome uh, but a lot of people would say something like well it's nothing or well no thank you and you know they say something like that and you know most of the time i guess it's okay but it can also kind of communicate that you're not accepting their thanks you know what i'm saying i mean when somebody wants to thank you uh, you should probably just let them uh, do that uh, they're trying to be respectful to you and sometimes you can miscommunicate uh especially if it's somebody that's not familiar with that no thank you uh, routine uh, they might actually be offended by that or think that you're not accepting their thanks i'm kind of going on about that but <laughs> anyway uh make custom making customers feel welcomed i mean this is huge 
even here at St. Cloud State, we have all these uh, imperatives about uh, students not feeling welcome. So they say, if, all these studies show that the students that feel like they belong here at St. Cloud State, if, if you feel that sense of belonging, uh, you're a lot more likely to graduate. So it, it's not just, this is not just, you know, being nice. It's not just uh, <laughs> being being polite. I mean, this is, like, this leads to, like, real bottom line, uh, you know, this, this is money here, basically. If your customer comes into the store, and in your first, <laughs> I'll give you, give you the comparison. Uh, so when you go to Walmart, uh, there's somebody there called a greeter, and they'll say, uh, "Hi, welcome to Walmart." Blah blah blah. And you think, well, that's that's nice, right? But uh, in a way, it kind of makes you feel more welcome in the store. Uh, that's why they do it. They pay people to have these greeters there. They wouldn't just be paying that person for no reason. Uh, they're doing that precisely. Uh, to make customers feel more welcome because then they'll be more likely to come back and, and buy something from the store. Now compare that uh, to a store that I really just hate going into. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to mention the name of it, uh, but it's a major sort of electronic store uh, with TV, big TVs and appliances and uh, computers. And every time I go in there, uh, they're, 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 I feel like they're watching me to make sure I don't shoplift anything. You know, they're just kind of creeping around. Uh, they're sort of got you in the corner of their eyes at all times, it feels like. And I just feel like I'm not welcome there and I <laughs> just need to get whatever I need and get the heck out <laughs> before they call the cops. I mean, uh, it just really is weird uh, having that, that feeling. Uh, so I don't ever shop there. What they really ought to do is, is go back to copycat from a Walmart, you know, and have a greeter there that says, hi, welcome, you know. And, and then not sit there and watch watch you like a hawk all the time. I mean, what are you gonna do? Still like a, one of those giant stick one of those giant TVs in your pocket? I mean, I don't I don't know what their deal is, uh, but I definitely don't feel welcome there. Uh, using technology appropriately, uh, obviously, what they're talking about here is the, the cell phones. You know, it's just it's just so. And you know, even I was watching the State of the Union address. And, you know, you got all these uh, people that are in the back and you got these sort of rows up here and, you know, kind of closer to the main floor. And I noticed there were even some people like here and like here and here that were just kind of looking at a cell phone uh, the whole time. And you kind of wonder, like, <laughs> you know, you're at the State of the Union address. Uh, what could be more riveting, you know? Uh, if you went to the trouble to be there, I assume you're interested in the politics, right? So, you know, what could is it is a good time to look at cat photos or uh, respond to things on Twitter? Uh, I don't know, no, but it just it, to me, even as a I don't want to get political here, obviously, but it just kind of looked like they were disrespecting uh, the, uh, the the president. Maybe that was maybe that was the goal, right? Maybe they wanted to kind of communicate. Look, I don't care what this person's saying. <laughs> uh, I want to just kind of. Even I, they, they're on camera, right? Everybody, they must have known that people were, were watching them uh, do this. So maybe, unless that was the goal, was to show disrespect, which might have been, let's, let's face it. Um, if that wasn't the goal there, they really shouldn't have been on that phone. They, they should have been looking, you know, and, and trying to make an effort to at least look like they were paying attention. Uh, and then you saw, you know, of course, the people back here, I don't even know if they ever even looked up from their no, phones the whole time <laughs> they were there uh, so my, my point here is not that yeah if you don't like the president i don't care i'm not, I'm not a political guy uh, what i'm saying is by being on the on, by, by texting and being caught on camera doing it it sent the message that you were disrespectful or that you felt like you had something better to do someplace you'd rather be uh, and who knows how that's going to translate into votes you know, I don't know. But anyway, I guess before I leave off this one point, uh, I would say that <laughs> uh, what I suggest, and this is what I've gotten in the habit of doing, if, if there's a meeting, I just leave the phone, I leave my cell phone in my office, or I at least I put it on silent, I put it in my pocket, and I don't have it out. And I, because if once you bring that sucker out, you know, it's just going to be too temp. You're going to be too tempted to, to get on it, and you might think, "Well, I just want to check something real quick." You know, <laughs> uh, forget about it. All, all you're going to do is you're going to look like a jerk 
uh, that feels like you've got something more important to do uh, than pay attention to that meeting. And you're going to end up uh, offending people. Again, you might not care, uh, but if you do care, then you probably want to leave the phone out of sight, out of mind. Uh, you can always look at it when the uh, meeting is over. All right, let's look at the networking uh, information here. Uh, basically, we're talking about the ability to connect with many different kinds of people. I think that's the key to this. Uh, it's easy to network with your own family or your best friends. You know, I don't even know if that's really uh, networking, right? Uh, the hard thing is when you're uh, at an office meeting or a conference where there's people from all over the world there and you don't want to just stand around not talking to anybody. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're there. The whole reason they have these things is so you can network and start making connections. Uh, yeah, hopefully before they they are needed. And I'm not necessarily the best uh, the best networker either. It's just something I've had to kind of force myself to do. I'm typically a pretty introverted person, uh, but there are some things you can do to sort of subtly uh, change this. Uh, they talk here about being part of the grapevine. You know, trying to show some interest in what your colleagues do, what your coworkers do, uh, not just shutting yourself off into your office all the time. Or, you know, if, you, if you're at the, if you're the person that's got the earphones in, the iPods in all the time, uh, while you're at the office, then you're clearly not part of that grapevine. You might as well not even be there, really, <laughs> uh, when it comes right down to it, because you're doing a horrible job at networking. Yeah, even more important as you climb the, the corporate ladder, uh, what they're getting at here is, you know, if you are part of the grapevine, if you do have great connections, if you do have, uh, if you know a lot of people and you know how to talk to them and you're friendly with lots of people, then uh, when it comes time for that promotion, uh, it's not just you in the office talking about how great you are, but you got all those coworkers saying, yeah, you yeah, know, it'd be great. I, everybody likes Matt. You know, it'd be I'd love for him to get that. A promotion. We, we'd love to have him as a, as a manager and so on. <laughs> so you see, there's a lot of value here. It's not just uh, sucking up or you know complimenting people or anything like that. It's it's just kind of being part of that community, showing interest in other people. So here we could dig a little bit deeper into this idea of these workplace networks. Uh, so the first one is conversational, or who talks to whom. Uh, there's been studies of this and network, I think it's called network theory, is where a lot of this stuff gets uh, gets talked about and studied. Uh, but they'll usually find that, let's say you had an office with 50 employees in it. And they'll say, they'll do these sort of charts and, they'll, and you can look at that and see that really there's there might be one or two people in that company that talk to everybody or almost everybody. Uh, but most of the, the cells there, they're really only connected to a couple of other points. So you might be an employee at a company and you only talk to like your immediate coworkers and you really don't know anybody else there at the company. Uh, that's not good for networking. You know, you're better off if you can talk to a lot of different people, if you have those connections laid, because uh, I mean, for, if nothing else, you'll be better known. Uh, so when they are thinking about, well, who should we promote or you know, who would be good for this? Uh, at least they know who you are. You know, if you're one of those people that just is in the background the whole time and nobody know, even knows you're there, uh, you can imagine you're not going to be very likely to get that uh, that raise or that, that recognition even. Uh, this is a problem, by the way, I'll just say for the online workers, because it's really kind of an unfair advantage. Or if you're at a, a job where there's a day shift and a night shift, uh, I feel like a lot of times the people on the night shift are at a disadvantage. Because usually the really important people at the company are at the morning shift, the day shift. And if you're on that day shift and you can get to know them, uh, then you're more likely to get, they're more likely to promote you. Uh, even if there's somebody on that night shift uh, that's a lot better at the job, they just, you know, maybe the manager doesn't even know that never sees those people. Uh, so you can imagine that times 10 online. Uh, you know, they, they might not even know you exist. So maybe there's nothing you can do about it, but but if at all possible, uh, being a good uh, having a good conversational network is is a great place to start. Uh, expertise, who, who can be turned to for advice? Uh, so this is another one that's just so vital, been so vital for me, uh, being somebody who likes uh, computers and technology. Uh, I'm not a 
I don't know everything, obviously, but I, I kind of have a reputation for this, right? I've been able to help uh, colleagues and students and uh, you know, pretty much anybody that says, uh, look, I'm having some trouble with this. I can't figure out how to upload this. Or I, don't, I don't know how to set this course up you know, in D2L, whatever. Uh, so they might say, well, go talk, go talk, let's go talk to Matt. I bet you he's probably done this before. He might be able to help. Uh, that can be a good way to meet people. And it's a really good way to meet people, too, because they're kind of coming to you already with this idea that you know, you're somebody who, who knows a little something. Uh, you, you got some good advice uh, that you might be able to give them. And it just it looks good. It's just building up a good uh, workplace uh, network. <laughs> I guess it could be bad, right? <laughs> you know, people are just calling you constantly with every little minor thing. Uh, but I think the net result would be uh, a good, I think in the end it would work out to be a, a good thing. Uh, trust is another one. Uh, really, this other stuff doesn't even matter, right? If you're out blabbing everybody's uh, personal information, or you're, you're giving uh, much worse, giving away uh, you know corporate secrets, uh, leaking information. Uh, if you lose everybody's trust and you get a reputation for being dishonest or uh, a blabbermouth, let's say, uh, then obviously it doesn't really matter how much of an expert you are, how many people you know. If, if they know they, if they feel like they can't talk to you because you're just going to go run tell everybody else, uh, then uh, you, your network will uh, fall apart. Uh, so this one, again, this this trust one, it kind of bothers me in a way uh, because sometimes uh, you need to blab, right? You know, somebody's telling you, hey, look, I've been stealing uh, money from the company. <laughs> or, or, you know, we can imagine many terrible things that they might uh, tell you about. Uh, well, you know, sometimes you, you really do need to... Uh, violate their trust they're not really worthy of your trust right with that those kind of shenanigans so you might have to break this uh, but on the other hand uh, if it is if i do tell you something personal and you say you're not going to tell anybody and it's not really anything that anybody else needs to know uh, well something like that obviously you know you don't want to you want to maintain the trust right and so let's get in here to uh, time management and i I always tell students that we have a word for uh, people who are really good with time management. We call them bosses. Because <laughs> this is probably one of the hardest skills to get good at. It requires, uh, it's not just watching a clock and understanding uh, how to tell time, right? It's, it's about making really efficient use of your time. Also being able to make plans uh, with time uh, as a factor. Uh, how to get started on projects and then see them through to the end, not end up with a big crunch uh, towards the last, uh, you know, not end up with a crunch time where everybody's just scrambling at the very end. You know, nobody likes that kind of management, right? You, you know, you, you want a manager that's able to break up a project so that it's nice and comfortable and you got uh, plenty of time to do what, what needs to get done. And it's the same way uh, for you just really throughout all areas of your life. Right? It's just time management is really the key skill uh, I would put it up there, right up there with communication. And uh, a big part of, part of it, we'll get more into this here in a second, is prioritizing uh, the demands of your time. Uh, figuring out um, what is the most important demand first. I like to think of it, when I show up at the office on Monday morning and I open up my email and I start thinking about the classes I'll be teaching, uh, that week, I, I always kind of think about it as first of all, first and foremost, are there fires that need to be put out? You know what I mean by that is, is, is there any kind of big, you know, big uh, crisis going on? Is there, is there something that uh, really I have to get to first? Uh, for example, maybe I, for, maybe the lecture I uploaded that I'm supposed to teach at nine o'clock, and maybe I'm trying to uh, open my PowerPoint, and it won't open. Okay, that, that's a problem, right? I might have to run back home and, and re-upload it. Uh, so that's the kind of th thing that you need to be aware of. Uh, or it could be something like uh, you've got three tasks that need to be done, uh, or you've got three calls, three sales calls, or three uh, service calls, and you want to be able to look at those and figure out, well, this one is from a major client and involves you know, a big account. You probably want to deal with that uh, before you get down to a relatively minor problem. Uh, or one of the examples I give to students is when they, uh, in 191, and a lot of times as a student, you have several things due tomorrow. You might have a quiz in one class. Uh, you've got a, uh, an essay due in another class. And they're like, I don't know. I can't do I can't do everything. You know, what, what should I do? Um, 
and I always say, look at the, you know, go back to the syllabus and look at where the, that grade breakdown is and, you know, try to figure out, try to compute basically uh, what's going to, ha which one of those assignments will have the biggest impact on your grade, right? <laughs> uh, so if it's the quiz, uh, you want to make sure you want to focus on that. Uh, but maybe that essay is actually more important. You might have a big late fee or late penalty if you don't turn that in on time. So maybe you should focus your efforts there. Uh, but at least that's a place to start, a place to kind of start thinking about priorities. Uh, you could also think, of course, about, uh, well, if, if that's a course, it's, it's is that a course that's going to have a big impact on your ability to do your job, <laughs> uh, your career that you're interested in? Obviously, you might want to put that first. But uh, really, the point here is that you do put some thought into how you organize your time. Now, here's some techniques for doing this. And th this is by far my favorite is keeping lists, uh, prioritizing them. Uh, I do this pretty much every week, every day sometimes. I'll come in and I'll say, well, I, I teach it. Let's say I teach at 11 o'clock. It's, now it's 9 o'clock. I've got uh, some, some time here. Let me make a list and see what I can get done. Uh, what's something that's really pressing? See if I can knock that out real quick. Uh, there's lots of uh, self-help books you can get uh, that'll tell you to do these things, but it's really, really nice. And something else that ni is nice about keeping lists, and what I'll do is I'll keep like a little checklist. And I'll, you know, put my, I'll put the task there and I'll leave a little box here on down, uh, kind of like that. And then as I get, get one done, I'll put a little check. <laughs> yeah. You know, and by the end of the day, I'll have this, you know, a whole lot of checks and, you know, I can really look at that list and feel like I've, I've got a lot done, you know, and that feels pretty good. It's, it's a nice way to increase your productivity. Uh, it's kind of a visual way to see the, the progress you've made. I, I just think it's really, really nice. Uh, I want you to get into the habit of doing it too. I, th I think you'll also uh, enjoy, it's kind of an enjoyable thing, really. I uh, do large, important tasks uh, first. You know, sometimes I'll, have to disagree with some of these these points. Uh, some of the self-help books I've read, uh, they get a little bit more granular than this. And so sometimes it's a task. They'll tell you, well, if you can get the if you can do something in uh, under two minutes, just go ahead and do it. All right. So if it's just you know if an, if a student emails me a question, it's just a quick little question, and I can just respond to that. You know, boom, bada boom, bada bing, <laughs> and just go ahead and do it. Uh, it's not worth uh, setting it aside to do later. You, know, you, might, you might actually forget to do it later. Uh, so sometimes I would break some of these rules. But yeah, in general, if it's something really crucial, uh, just put everything else aside. Maybe even just shut off emails. Just shut off everything else. And just, just get that done. And then you can turn it all back on when you're done. And I, I do this with these PowerPoint videos I'm making here, right? I just turn off everything because uh, I really just need to focus and get this, this, this video done, get this video out. And I can't do that if I'm uh, over here checking email all the time. Uh, breaking large tasks in, into small chunks, another huge, huge thing. Uh, this is what English 191 is all about, if you, if you think about it. It's uh, think about that essay and you got think about it in terms of a planning phase and a drafting phase and a uh, editing phase. And a, you got a final draft. All right. So really all that is is saying take that big task and Break it up. <laughs> you might say uh, the task one just be the uh, all this will be is just a rough draft of the introduction. And that's something you can get done, right? If you just say I'm going to write that entire essay today, and you think about it as one big task, it can get really intimidating. Now, finding blocks of time. Now, people say that uh, you know, if it's important to you, you'll find time to do it. Uh, but one of the problems I find with students a lot is that they'll they'll always be waiting for that big block of time. Uh, they'll say, "Well, I mean, I'll I want I got some time. I got a couple hours this afternoon. I could work on my assignment, but you know what? I'm just going to wait till the weekend because uh, then I'll have all weekend to do it, and I'll have a huge block of time. And it's like they're imagining that when the weekend rolls around, that they're not <laughs> they're not going to have anything else they'd rather do. <laughs> and so I say, "Don't don't don't do that." You know, if you've got only, you know, if you if you know you have this project due on Monday, and uh, here it is, uh, maybe it's uh, Thursday, and you've got a little gap in between your classes where you got a couple hours in between, I say don't just waste that time. You know, uh, go to the computer lab 
And if all you do is just kind of take some notes or make a rough outline or just any little thing you can do will be uh, a lot better. It'll be a lot better for you later on because you'll feel like, well, you know, I've already got some progress made. Uh, and it's a lot easier to keep that ball rolling uh, than it is to start. Uh, the longer you put something off, the harder it is to start. It just kind of build up in your mind and build up in your, in your mind. Uh, so, again, don't even if it's just a 15 minute half hour whatever it is uh, try to leverage that time don't just waste it yeah here's another one avoiding that the time sinks uh, there's so many of these uh, usually it involves Google <laughs> or you get into Facebook you're emailing and sometimes I can just uh, one of the things I've noticed that uh, here at St. Cloud State we have this list serve and it's just kind of basically a big email chat where faculty members can get on, get on there and, and chat about uh, what's going on on campus or uh, issues, educational stuff. And it's really easy just to, to get on that and you end up wasting, you know, the whole afternoon um, responding to some of these things. And uh, it doesn't really matter. It's, <laughs> you're not really benefiting anybody by participating on that. I, I don't feel it's just kind of it's just a huge waste of time. And it, it's really time you could have spent uh, you'd have had a much better use of your time uh, making, uh, preparing for your classes or doing some, uh, some of your own personal research. It's just a time sink. And I'm sure you have some of these in your own life. You have, you have to find those. Uh, deciding at the end of the day what you will accomplish tomorrow. Uh, this, this is a nice one. I haven't tried this one before, but I see what they're, what they're getting at. Uh, so maybe as you're thinking about uh, heading home, you know, it's close to time. Maybe you uh, think, well, let me just make a quick little list here to get started on tomorrow with stuff I'd like to do. Uh, yeah, I could see that working. Let's see. Evaluate what didn't get done <laughs> at the end of week. <laughs> yeah, so probably with you're like me and you have your list made. Uh, this, this is at the end of the week, but maybe even uh, at the end of the day. You know, maybe you got up to there, but you didn't get this stuff done. Uh, so you could take a look at this and decide, well, you know, is it bad that this didn't get done or should I make that top priority tomorrow? You know, that makes sense. All right, let's look at a couple other things about time management. Uh, one is the idea of multitasking. And the book tells you, and I think this is very true, that this is really just a myth. Uh, students come to me all the time and they say, you know, I can easily text my friends and I can look at Facebook and and I can play a little game on my uh, iPad and I can do all this and somehow still pay attention to you. <laughs> or you might say, you know, I can put this uh, video video on in the background while I'm looking at Facebook. You might be looking at Facebook right now <laughs> saying, you know what, it's fine though. I can still hear what he's saying. Uh, but really what you're doing is just totally destroying your attention. Uh, you, you're you basically, you might as well have a one eye closed, right? Or, or have somebody screaming in your ear. I mean, it's just terrible. And this is why they tell you not to text and drive. Because no matter how well you think you can do it, uh, your focus is not where it needs to be. <laughs> hey, you're driving a car. Okay, you, this thing is a weapon on wheels. You know, you kill somebody, not just yourself, but, but innocent people while you're driving this, this <laughs> death machine, basically. And do you really want to be like uh, only dedicating a small percentage of your attention to, to where you're pointing that thing? You know, that, that's just, uh, yeah, I don't know if evil is the right word, but it's, it's just certainly uh, unwise. And so just kind of eradicate this idea of multitasking. Uh, I always say if it's, if it's really important, you know, it's, it's your life, right? You've only got so many hours on this planet. If it's something that's uh, so unimportant that you feel like you can, uh, put it, you know, third or fourth priority, uh, then maybe you really should just not even be there. You know, <laughs> uh, find something more worthy of your time. Yeah, research shows it doesn't work as effectively as people believe. Yeah, this is the problem is they believe, oh, yeah, you know, I, I can do this and I can be fully aware. And, you know, I have students sometimes they'll get so deep into their uh, Facebook and their texting that they will... Uh, it's just it's almost like somewhere halfway in the middle of class, I'll just be like, <gasps> you know, like oh, just having some kind of <laughs> wake up moment. You're like, whoa, what, what's going on over here? And it's like, 
they basically got so deep into this other world that they kind of got snapped <laughs> back to reality and it startled them so much they they sort of panicked there for a minute and had this gasp <laughs> i mean of course everybody laughs at them and they should laugh at them i mean that's just ridiculous uh, you're supposed to be uh, participating in class uh, you're not supposed to be off in this other world uh, it just looks bad <clears throat> and i'm sure they, they would probably tell you Oh, no, I was there the whole time. I was paying attention. I, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, startup delay uh, when switching tasks and picking up uh, the old tasks. Yeah, this is a, this is another thing that multitaskers, oh, I'm so great at multitasking. Look at me. You know, I can switch over here real quick and check Facebook and check email. And, uh, they, they don't, they're not really aware. <clears throat> you know, let's just say that I'm making this video and I say, uh, I'm just going to stop here and check Facebook. And I'll come back and finish the video. And I might think that's just going to take a couple of minutes to do. Uh, but oblivious to me, I might, have, I, might have, I might have been on that Facebook for an hour. You know, it felt, it felt like a couple of minutes, but I was there for an hour. You know, so this, this is another huge thing. You're not aware of it. Uh, just don't, don't, don't get to Facebook. Just <laughs> finish the assignment. Finish the project. Then you can do it. Uh, don't sw keep switching up stuff uh, as you're working. Yeah, possibly hurts overall attention and memory. Uh, yeah, I fully believe this. Yeah, uh, the you know if you're like every couple of seconds or let's be more realis realistic. So you're listening to a lecture, you get bored, uh, you look at the you look at your phone for a while, uh, you come back, you pay attention some more. You, let's say you do that three or four times uh, throughout the lecture. Uh, really, what you've done there is more than likely you, a lot of that lecture just going right by you. So when it comes time for you to recall it on a quiz or a test or to, to apply it, it's not there. Okay, finally, let's wrap this up with some trends in uh, business communication because I, I know you want to <laughs> get done with this so you can check Facebook. So let's, let's move on. Uh, the trend, data security, uh, you've heard about this in the news all the time. It's, uh, it's one of those things where it's not like people want to leak information or they, they want to be crummy employees or they want to get in trouble. Obviously not. It's just they're not aware of this. They think, well, I can just forward this email uh, to somebody else or, or I can uh, take a picture. Uh, I could take a selfie here at the, at, the, at the lab and post that to Facebook. And they like, look at the in the background of that photo. There was uh, some, you know, top secret stuff, you know, confidential stuff in that photo. Or that that email you forwarded that, that had confidential information. You you violated uh, patient confidentiality with this. Uh, so this this is a huge one, and it can be really it can get you in a lot of trouble. So uh, my advice is, uh, if in doubt, if if there's any doubt at all, uh, just either don't send that or don't don't post that photo, or whatever it is, or at the very least clear it first. You know, ask your uh, manager, is this okay? Is there any concerns here? Uh, it's definitely better to be uh, safe than sorry uh, on that one. Uh, same thing with passwords. I mean, I could go on and on. <laughs> yeah, it kind of ties into electronic privacy. Uh, you see people have a password, and it, you know, sh there'll be a post-it note right here on this laptop with the login and password. <laughs> How secure is that? It, it's not secure at all. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why they want and make you keep switching passwords, you know, to, to try to keep uh, keep this out of the uh, hackers. Uh, customer service, I guess that's a trend in business communication. That seemed like that's always been there. I'm not really sure why they see this as, as a trend, but uh, I suppose uh, good customer service uh, might be a trend. You know, you really hate it when you call up a tech support line and it's just all, all uh, automated it's just all robotic and none of the menu items uh, correspond to your problem. Uh, that, that's not very helpful. <laughs> uh, work family balance. I think this is great. Uh, you know, it used to be that it was really hard to have a job, full time job, if you wanted to have kids. Uh, but really, really kind of getting now where that's it's OK. There'll be some uh, leave time. Uh, environmental concern. You know, thank thank goodness for this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not, it's kind of moving beyond pollution. You might think, well, I don't work at a chemical factory or whatever. We don't have this 
Uh, we don't have a big carbon footprint or whatever. Uh, but even little things, you might think, uh, you know, do I, do I really need to print this 200-page document out? Uh, maybe I could just stick that on the tablet and read it. Uh, save a little, save some trees. Uh, globalization, globalization and outsourcing. You, know, you might think this is a, I don't know if you think this is a positive or a negative trend. Uh, that kind of gets, well, you know, it gets pretty, <laughs> this can get political uh, really quickly. But, you know, I think it is safe to say that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to think of a business nowadays uh, where, there, where it's all just local. You know, there's going to be aspects of any business that will involve uh, companies in other countries, or at the very least, your, your customer base. It's very likely that you'll have a, a people there, not just from the hometown or the area, but from all, people might have moved there from all over the world. Yeah, diversity, uh, teamwork. You know, you hear this word diversity a lot. It gets uh, uh, people see it. Uh, and certainly should see it as, as a positive thing, but you know, of course, it does mean that uh, the resources need to be there to support it. Uh, you'll find uh, sometimes, uh, say, uh, when you're communicating, and we'll get more into this, I'm sure, later on in the semester, but uh, it's something to be aware of, even in a PowerPoint uh, video. You know, the references that you're making. Uh, if I'm talking here, if I'm using a bunch of uh, metaphors and, uh, from football, like touchdown and goal lines and and <laughs> <laughs> and quarterbacking and, and so on and so forth. Well, if the if I got a, a workforce there, and they, first of all, they, when I say football, they probably think I'm talking about soccer. Uh, so again, it's it's a trend that's it's it's a great opportunity, but you know only if it's properly uh, understood and leveraged. Uh, teamwork. Uh, this one gets us into trouble all the time uh, because the students are used to working in, by themselves. They hate working in groups, and, and even in this class. Uh, I'll have students sometimes tell me, you know, uh, I don't want to work with anybody else on this group project. I just, I just want to do my own thing. Uh, I don't like working in groups. <laughs> I, t I tell them, I can't believe you're, you're telling me this. I mean, this would be like going into a job interview, and when they ask you that question about, you know, how well do you work with others? If you were to say, I, I hate it. You know, I just, I just want to do my own thing. I hate having to take orders, and I hate giving other people orders. <laughs> I hate sharing responsibility. Well, fine, you, you hate it, but, you know, guess what? Uh, if, if you don't have it, uh, you're not going to get the job. You're not going to get promoted. So it's something that you just have to figure out how to get good at. And, and we will talk more about it um, throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, job flexibility, um, you know, that's just kind of the reality nowadays, right? We There's very few of us that just, I guess I'm kind of the exception of I've started at St. Cloud State. I hope to eventually retire here. Uh, but for most people, they might switch jobs two or three times. Or they might be a, a contractor and have uh, never really have a, a steady, stable employer. You know, you might have to have a more flexibility with that. Uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, these opportunities for this really come and go. Uh, every now and then I run into a student with a great idea, uh, some way to something really that sounds innovative, some some business project they want to uh, latch on to. And all I can tell them is, you know, if you think it's a good idea and you got some support for it, you just, you just need to go for it. Uh, if you keep talking about it and talking about it, eventually either somebody else is going to get there first. Right. And that's no good. <laughs> uh, or you'll just kind of tire yourself out. Uh, by doing more talking than doing. Well, let's see, big data. Yeah, that's that. This is we've been seeing this in teaching now, but uh, they've got these huge databases now, and it's, it's almost kind of scary. I could talk about this all day, but uh, some of these concerns about the, the artificial intelligences. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you got something like Facebook, and man, it's just accumulating just I don't know how many terabytes of data uh, about you and you know, your friends and your networks and, you know, all this data is out there and companies are trying to figure out how to use it and they might not be using it in ways that you would necessarily like. All right, so it is a concern. Uh, you know, back in the day before we had these uh, supercomputers and everything, there wasn't really much they could do with all this data. Uh, but now that the computers are getting so much uh, bigger and, and faster and 
you know, bigger processors and whatever, uh, they might really be able to start leveraging this. And, in, and to tell you the truth, it's, it's kind of a little bit scary sometimes. Uh, I won't get into that that here, but it's definitely I do agree it is a trend uh, that needs to be uh, need to keep an eye on that. Whew, man, okay, I think that'll do it for today. Um, if you do have questions about any of this, please let me know, and I'll see you next time.